Okay, today we're doing our second class of the Chlorophyta. So you remember Chlorophyta is the division. Physi is the ending for class. And this is the Alvophysi. So Alva is a genus within this class. So this time the name of the class comes from a name of a genus. And in fact, there are suggestions, or suggestions, there are non-binding rules within the botanical code of nomenclature that say that you should name the higher level groups based on the name of a genus within that group. So in many cases that isn't exactly followed, but in some cases it is, and here Ovophyce is one of those cases. Charophyce is gonna be a next one, next class that we do, and that will also be named on a genus within that class. So the Ovophyce. Now we're starting the Ovophyce, but mainly what we're gonna be talking about today is life cycles. We have two new types of life cycles to learn, and we have a lot of variations on those life cycles. So this is a big life cycle day. Not that there's any day that isn't a big life cycle day in this class, but this is a really big one. First of all, the characteristics of the Ovophyce. So remember that there's a non-elaborated spindle. There's no phycoplast or phragmoplast. Phycoplast, again, and it helps if you can picture these things now. So when I'm talking about this, I'm having a, I have a picture in my mind of what this looks like. So there's no phycoplast. Phycoplast was those extra microtubules that were parallel to the new cell plate. There's no phragmoplast. Phragmoplast were those microtubules that were perpendicular to the new cell plate or were parallel to the spindle in those cases where there's an elaborated spindle. So cell division, non-elaborated spindle, no, which means no phycoplast or phragmoplast in the olophyce. The nuclear envelope then, however, still does persist during mitosis. So this is a case again where the nuclear envelope, where the nuclear envelope persists and the nuclei stay close together. So the nuclei are close together. Unlike the chlorophyce, these guys are marine. There's always exceptions, but a very large percentage, more than 90%, probably more than 95% are marine in this case. So it is a marine group. Just like in the chlorophyce, the radial, the cells are radial, the mobile cells are radial. And we'll see in the next slide a little bit more detail what that means, especially for the insertion of the flagella. Radial cells with <clears throat> apically inserted flagella. So this is a characteristic or characteristics that they share with the chlorophyce. Life cycles, the life cycles are different now. So now we've got monobionic diploid or dibionic life cycles. So none of the organisms here, and pretty much there is not an exception to this, none of them are monobionic haploid. Monobionic haploid ones are the ones that occur in the chlorop chlorophyce. The ovophyce has monobionic diploid or dibionic life cycles. Associated with that is the fact that the zygote is not dormant. So it germinates soon after it is formed, and we'll see what happens to it next. It doesn't go through meiosis in these cases, not directly anyway. Like the other members of the chlorophyce, we have no glycolate oxidase. So ovophyce and chlorophyce have no glycolate oxidase. And we're back to flagella inserted apically. So let's look at the next slide and see what that means. So now we've learned some of the characteristics. We're going to try to elaborate on a few of them. And so if we look at a drawing based on an electron micrograph of the place of flagella insertion in the chlorophyce and the ovophyce, both of these guys have radial cells, flagella inserted <laughs> apically and they're inserted symmetrically like this, the yellow there are the flagella. Whereas in the charophyce, and we'll return to this, so I'm not gonna go into great detail on charophyce yet, but in the charophyce we have this lateral insertion of the flagella. So 
these are the flagella. And if you look at the base of those flagella, you see that there are these sets of microtubules, and they come out in a cross-shaped pattern. It's a little hard to tell there that they're cross-shaped, but imagine looking down on this, and it would look like a cross, just a straight or a plus sign. So it's going to be different in the Charophyce, but we'll come to that later on. We'll come back to that on Tuesday, probably. OK, our life cycles. So now we have to learn monobionic diploid life cycle. And we should get an idea already of what that life cycle looks like if we look at the name of the life cycle. Mono, one, bios, life, TI. See a relationship diploid, meaning that the multicellular individual or the multicellular organism is diploid, and there's only one of them. So I'll say that a different way. I'll say, and there is no haploid multicellular individual. Right up here in the erased individual and right organism. And so that parts of that, the multicellular parts, monobionic tells us that, and the fact that that is diploid, the second part of the name tells us that. So we should be able to draw it pretty easily. I'm going to erase what I've just written so that I can draw it on this same slide. And we know that the first thing we're going to do is draw our horizontal line. We're going to write haploid above. And even those folks who are not taking notes should be doing this because it is actually impossible to learn this without drawing these out. Diploid below, haploid above, meiosis. On the left side, below the line, syngamy. On the right side, above the line, syngamy leads to the zygote. And now we've got to figure out the rest of it. So there's going to be a multicellular diploid individual. multicellular diploid organism down there. And there's not going to be any multicellular haploid organism up here. So this is now starting to look like us. We actually have our humans, mammals, have monobionic diploid life cycles. And so you know what happens in meiosis in these cases. Meiosis gives rise to the gametes. And we're still going to call them plus and minus gametes. So we have meiosis giving rise to the gametes directly and the gametes fusing in syngamy. Multicellular diploid organism, where does that come from and where does it go to? Well, it comes from the zygote and it goes to meiosis, but like in our case, the whole organism doesn't undergo meiosis. Not every cell in your body undergoes meiosis. There are certain cells that are set aside, in our cases, in the germline, um, that in embryonic development, that undergo meiosis later in life. And there are certain cells here, again, in this case, that are going to undergo meiosis. And now we just have to learn the term for them. 
So to get the term from them, let's think about what the term for this organism is, the multicellular diploid organism. Well, we know that meiosis usually r results in spores, and that'll make more sense when we do the next life cycle. And so the organism that's down here is going to be called the spore-bearing plant, the sporophyte. So the zygote then is going to divide by mitosis or meiosis, by the way, by mitosis to produce our sporophyte, our multicellular diploid organism. So I'll put that in parentheses now because we know the term for the sporophyte. The sporophyte is going to have certain containers within it in which meiosis is going to take place. And so we could call those containers, a container or a box or, oh, heck, let's just do it in Greek. The word for that is a is angium. It means box in Greek. And they're going to contain the spores. Now, in this life cycle, we have no spores. We have gametes directly. But in all the other life cycles, we'll see meiosis results in spores. And so we call this the sporangium. And spore, you know, remember, means seed. And that's it, the monobionic diploid life cycle. You notice it is the exact opposite, the exact inverse of the monobionic haploid life cycle. Monobionic haploid, we have the multicellular organism, the gametophyte in the haploid portion of the life cycle. There's another type of life cycle, the dibionic. Again, let's look at the roots of this word. Di is the new root. It means two. What could be we referring to when we refer to two in this case? Two. Two multicellular organisms. And one is going to be what? And the other one is going to be diploid. So now we should be able to easily draw this life cycle. I'll do it with you first, but next, I'm going to ask you in just a minute to draw it on your own. So be thinking about that. Let's just, for the heck of it, use a different color. Horizontal line, meiosis. Over on the left, syngamy on the right. Syngamy gives rise to the zygote. This is the diploid portion below. This is the haploid portion above. And we've just said dibionic means we're going to have those two multicellular parts of the life cycle. So what's the haploid multicellular organism called? What goes up there? The gametophyte. And what comes down here in the diploid multicellular portion? We just learned that one, the sporophyte. Now we know that. It's just now a matter of putting together our two life cycles. On the bottom, we draw what we drew for the monobionic diploid life cycle. And on the top, we draw what we drew for the monobionic haploid life cycle. This life cycle puts them together. So we can just go around. Let's start with meiosis. Meiosis is going to produce the myospores, which are going to go through mitosis, divide my mitosis to produce our gametophyte, which is going to produce our plus and minus gametes. Which are going to unite in syngamy to produce our zygote, which grows by mitosis through, through mitosis to produce the sporophyte. The sporophyte contains the sporangium, spore box. And in that spore box, 
meiosis occurs. So we don't mean by this second, this last arrow here, we don't mean that the sporangium undergoes meiosis, we mean what's in the sporangium goes, undergoes meiosis and produce the myospores. And so you see now with this life cycle, we have the sporangium makes sense because it is the organ that is going to contain, after meiosis, the spores, the myospores. Pretty simple. Let's see. Whoops, where's my slide? Oh, I'm supposed to have a slide there that says draw it yourself. We will create one. Ignore this for a minute. Draw a dibionic life cycle. And when you draw this life cycle, what should you be using? The most important study pool you have. Yes, your mind. That's really good. That's better than my study tool. <laughs> My study tool is a blank piece of paper. So combine these two great study tools, your mind with a blank piece of paper and a pencil, and you've got it. Do not look at what you just wrote down while I was doing this. Not if you want to pass this class, do not do that. Draw it from memory. I promise not to come and look over your shoulder and see if you got it right. Okay, so we've looked at our basic dibionic life cycle with our gametophyte and sporophyte. And now I want you to notice something. I want you to notice something that we've been drawing about this life cycle, and that is that there is a single gametophyte up here. One gametophyte. And it says myospores down here. So it's possible that other kinds of relationships can happen in that haploid stage. There can be two gametophytes, first thing to notice. Second thing to notice is that there is a gametophyte and a sporophyte. I haven't said anything about whether those gametophyte and that sporophyte, what, anything about their morphology. Do they look like each other or do they look different from each other? And it varies in the different groups. So they can look the same or they can look different from each other. And so these are the two main variants we're going to learn, whether there is one or two gametophytes and whether this gametophyte-sporophyte relationship is a relationship where they look exactly alike or whether they look different from each other. And we have some new terms to learn with those things, of course. So let's just quickly draw out the life cycle again, because we don't have it on this slide. But we're going to do it slightly differently. So do not yet, don't draw the gametophyte yet. So meiosis, syngamy, zygote, sporophyte. Sporangium undergoes meiosis. This is all the diploid portion. The haploid portion is above. Meiosis now. Meiosis, when we draw myospores here, we can draw more than one arrow to indicate that there's more than one myospore. In fact, there can be different types of myospores. For now, we're just going to write the word myospores twice. And we're going to 
draw two gametophytes. I'll write the word gametophyte twice. One of those gametophytes is going to produce the minus gamete, and one of those gametophytes is going to produce the plus gamete. They're still going to unite in syngamy. We said that our gametophyte and our sporophyte now can look alike or they can look different. Now the two gametophytes always look exactly the same as each other. So I'm referring to the gametophytes in general and the sporophytes in general. Do they look alike or not? The word for form in Greek is morph. So you've heard about morphology. The, word, the root ology means the study of, so morphology, the study of form. I'm a morphologist, for instance, a higher plant morphologist. So iso means the same. And morphic means form. So when they look the same, we say that the life cycle is isomorphic. The gametophytes look like the sporophytes. You can't tell them a different. They really are remarkably similar. The only way you can tell that they're different is if you did a, um, a study on how much DNA was present in the cells. And you would see, of course, in the sporophyte, there'd be twice as much. So isomorphic, they look the same. The other alternative is heteromorphic, hetero meaning different. So in that case, they look different from each other. The gametophyte does not look like the sporophyte. And in some cases, they are very strikingly heteromorphic. They look nothing like each other. So we'll see both examples in the next group of organisms that we're going to be doing. Let's draw our life cycle one more time with two gametophytes again. And then we'll talk about our last set of terms. Well, we're not going to ever talk about the last set of terms, but the almost last set of terms. In fact, we're going to learn a term for the almost set last set of terms later on in the course. There's a term for that. OK, haploid above, diploid below, meiosis, syngamy on the right, the zygote coming from syngamy. Zygote undergoes mitotic cell divisions to produce the sporophyte. The sporophyte contains the sporangium. Meiosis occurs in the sporangium to produce our myospores. Just going to draw two myospores because one set of myospores is going to give rise to one gametophyte. The other myospores are going to give rise to the second gametophyte. And we can call these the minus and the plus gametophyte if we want to, just to distinguish them at this point. And the minus gametophyte is going to give rise to the minus gamete and the plus gametophyte to the plus gamete. And they unite in syngamy. So we know we've got terms now for the sporophyte and the gametophyte when they look alike or they don't look alike, isomorphic or heteromorphic. And now we have a new term, 
that refers to the fact that we have two gametophytes instead of one. So both type of life cycles exist. We can have in the haploid portion of the life cycle one single gametophyte producing two kinds of gametes or two types of gametophytes each producing one type of gamete. This type of life cycle is called heterophallic. Hetero, we know already, we just learned it, different. Phallus, phallic in this case. It's a little harder to understand that term. It means young shoot. By young shoot, the authors of the term means a shoot that doesn't have a vascular system in it. So these are people who are thinking about the higher plants. So we understood what was going on with the land plants before we really understood well what was happening in the algae. So a lot of our terminology is influenced by land plant kind of structures. And also, well, um, let me leave it at that for a minute. So there are land plants that do not have differentiated plant bodies. They don't, are, they're not differentiated into true roots, true stems, true leaves, flowers, and those kinds of things. Examples might be some of the mosses and the liverworts groups that we'll talk about later in the class around midterm. <coughs> So on those cases, we call the plant body a thallus. It didn't have differentiated parts like the higher vascular plants did. And so this term was also then applied to plant bodies of, of algae, things like the gametophytes in algae, were sometimes in the older term, in older books, called the thallus. And so that's how it gets here. It doesn't help us a lot in this case, but since we're doing roots, I wanted to say it means young shoot and more technically means than a plant body that is not differentiated into true roots, stems, and leaves. It has no true vascular system in the plant body. And the gametophytes are all, that's true of all these gametophytes. So heterothallic now is referring to the fact that there are two different gametophytes. So this life cycle that we've drawn is a heterothallic life cycle. Now, there is another kind of life cycle. Here it is on the board. In this life cycle, we have a single gametophyte. Now, it would make absolute perfect sense, wouldn't it, if we, the terms were parallel to those ones we just learned, isomorphic and heteromorphic, and we call this isothallic. But that would be too easy. They were thinking of these, my classes, when they made these terms, and they said, don't let those students get away with anything. We need a different term for this. When there is a single gametophyte here, we are going to call that homo one, or same. Same is better for homo phallic. Homo phallic. So we have. Just to confuse you, isomorphic and heteromorphic. That refers, look at the root of the base, morphic, refers to the form. And that's telling you you're comparing the sporified and the gametophyte up and down. And we have heterothallic and homothallic. Phallic, that tells you you're talking about just the gametophyte. Just that thing without roots and all that stuff. And hetero, there are two of them, homo, there's one of them. So heterothallic and homothallic are our two types of life cycles. We have got one more term to learn. I'm going to do it on the same page and just grab another color. One more term to learn today. the gametes. It turns out that in some cases, the gametes don't function as gametes. They do something else. 
So you really have to take that non that mammalian hat completely off now and think about gametes as cells that might fuse and might just start going undergoing mitosis. So in other words, a gamete could act kind of like a zoospore. Remember, a zoospore is a unicellular, mobile, reproductive cell that undergoes mitosis and reproduces the parent organism. And usually in asexual reproduction, we would draw, in our cases, we draw you know, a little cycle off on the side and say that's asexual reproduction, and sometimes that would be by zoospores. But the gametes can sometimes act as zoospores. And so when they do that, the gametes reproduce the gametophytes. So they act as zoospores and reproduce the gametophytes by mitotic cell divisions. The only meiosis that ever takes place is down here. So every other cell division in these life cycles is a mitotic cell division. Only at this one place do we have meiotic cell divisions. So these are mitotic cell divisions by the gametes, that's pretty weird, to reproduce the gametophytes. And the name of this process has really great significance for UNCG because it is called parthenogenesis. And did you all get that classical reference? The Parthenon was the temple of Athena. And Athena, yeah, well, she wasn't a Spartan, but she is our intellectual mascot. And so parthenogenesis is then this term. And why is that appropriate? Why is parthenogenesis an appropriate term for this gamete functioning as the gametophyte? So how was Athena born? You don't know? Um, from, from, the head of Zeus. from the head of Zeus. Did I tell you that or did you know? No, I took a first. That is so cool. I hardly know how to go on. <laughs> <laughs> so she was born out of the head of Zeus. And so Zeus's head was cut open and Athena sprang full born out of the head of Zeus. Now there's actually a lot more to the, you, you know the rest of the story, there's a lot more to the story than that. She actually had a mother, and the mother was name was Metis, and my company, I started a little company to promote software development, and the company's name is Metis. So Metis is the mother of wisdom, actually, the mother of um, <clears throat> the, the woman or the titan from the generation before Athena, who was the embodiment of wisdom. And Athena, then, her daughter, was the embodiment of wisdom, and that's why we have her as the mascot for our intellectual pursuits here. And that is enough about UNCG. Parthenogenesis is the name of this process because it is the gametes that are being involved here. It seems like it should be sexual reproduction, but it is not. They are acting through a process of mitosis and reproducing the gametophyte. And with that, we should go on and look at some of the organisms which have these characteristics. And so we'll do at least one of them today. Maybe we're doing well enough that we can do two of them. We're doing really great. I'm sorry, before you go on, so the part at the top is like heterophallic and the length of length. Oh, thank you. Yes. What two types of life cycles could be heterophallic? It's a question for you. Dibionic is possible because the dibionic life cycle has a gametophytic generation. What other life cycle has a gametophytic generation? Monobionic. Monobionic. Monobionic has a gametophyte generation. Gametophytes are haploid or diploid. See, now here's why it really is good if you have these things firmly in mind, because you don't have to remember whether gametophytes are haploid or diploid. You have that picture of the, of the life cycle in your mind, and you look at that picture of the life cycle in, that, in your mind's eye, and you say, gametophyte, where is it? It's in the haploid part of the life cycle. So you can get around a lot of the stuff you have to memorize for this course 
if you will just make sure that you can draw these life cycles out without thinking so that you have a very clear mental image of them. So the gametophytes are in the haploid portion of the life cycle. So this life cycle here that can be heterothallic has to be monobionic haploid. And the folks who said diploid could go back and make sure they understand why monobionic diploid is not the correct answer in that case. So monobionic haploid or dibionic life cycles have this. Monobionic diploid do not. They cannot be heterophallic or, <clears throat> or homophallic. Terms just don't apply. Cladophora. Our first really starting to be weird organism. It's a filament. Here's a cell. It's a branched filament. And now look at that kind of, look in those cells. Look how grainy that cell looks in there. Look at what, what is that stuff in that cell? Well, what's this? What's that? What's that? Well, that, that's a nucleus. You know what that is? That's a nucleus. This one here, that's a nucleus. And this one here, that is a nucleus. We could do this all day because there are a lot of nuclei in this cell. These cells are multinuclear. And you, you know what that means. There's a term for that. <clears throat> so this is the first of the organisms we're going to see that have multinuclear cells. And in fact, it's going to get even weirder than this in just, just a minute, or probably it will be Tuesday before we really get into that. But So these cells are, and it's a confusing term now, these cells are senocytic. Confusing because you're going to confuse it with synovic. So this does not mean that. Ceno still means common, but it's got cytic, and this is means bag. Or, and we can think of it as cell. For us, it's ocal. So that cytic, C Y T, that gives us our same roots, like cytoplasm comes from that. It's the, and now you know the roots for cytoplasm, right? You can kind of figure out what, cytopl what that word cytoplasm means cell, and then plasm, something molded and formed. So that's back to my story about the microscopist seeing the organelles inside the cell, inside that what they thought initially was fluid portion of the cell. Xenocytic. So xenocytic, then, is another way of saying multinuclear. Cell, the cells are multinuclear. The growth of these filaments is also unique. The growth is apical. So you can see them kind of coming off the side here. See there's no, in fact, no cell wall right there between the parent cell and the side branch. Initially, a cell wall will form and the growth is apical. So this is in contrast to what we've seen before, where we saw generalized growth in Ulthrix and intercalary growth in Etagonium. Now we have the third type of growth, apical growth. And apical growth is going to occur in a number of the higher algae and in all of the land plants. It's going to be a very typical kind of growth. It happens in different ways, but this is the first example we have of apical growth in this. We have now some cooled photos showing the three-dimensional structure of the organism. And I think the nice branched filaments show really well here in this confocal fluorescent view. You can see the three-dimensional nature of the filaments. The two light micrographs, of course, are not three-dimensional. And you can see 
a little bit of the chloroplasts again. It looks like we have in this case, in some cases, some of these band-shaped chloroplasts again in this case. But our main thing here is we wanted to show is the nice three-dimensional branching here. So it does have band-shaped chloroplasts? I'm not positive. It looks like band-shaped to me there. I don't have that in my notes, but it does. they do look band-shaped there. And of course, there are different species of Cladophora, and they may vary within the different species. Cladophora has zoospores, so there's asexual reproduction. And you might wonder how that happens in a cell which is senocytic. And basically what's going to happen now is that each of the nuclei is going to form a zoospore. So the cytoplasm rounds up around the nucleus. A cell membrane forms around that. A little cell wall, a cell wall forms around the cell membrane. Flagella develop, and the zoospores are released. So that's what we see going on here. And we see the zoospore zoospore release. And here is a zoospore. Like in other cases, it has a different number of flagella than the gametes. And I would never ask you to memorize number of flagella here. <clears throat> the other thing that we can see nicely in these diagrams is the structure of the cells, and we can see that there's a large vacuole which is transversed by cytoplasmic strands in these cells of Cladophora. So again, most of the chloroplasts and the nuclei and all those things are plastered out to the outside of the cell because the center is composed of this large vacuole. But in this case, the vacuole is transversed by these cytoplasmic strands. The zoospore, I forgot to say, settles down and forms a new individual. And here is the hold fast. So Cladophora, it's dibionic, heterophallic, isomorphic, parthenogenic, and we know it has asexual reproduction, and I believe that asexual reproduction takes place in the diploid part of the plant. So we want to draw that. So we draw the haploid above, the diploid below, meiosis over on the left, syngamy on the right, Syngamy producing the zygote. The zygote giving rise to the sporophyte. The sporophyte containing the sporangium, which is the place that meiosis occurs. So now we've got to be careful from now on because we've got to look at our terms and see what we draw in the haploid portion. So it's heterophallic. That means that there's going to be two gametophytes. So let's, I'm going to use different colors for each of these so you can see the term related to the color. So here's heterophallic, we'll make that green, and so we'll draw our gametophytes.
Dibionic, well, dibionic, you know, it just means that there is a gametophyte there. So in a way, we've got that already, but we can draw the rest of the life cycle here in the, di in the haploid stage with blue, the color I've circled the word dibionic with. So the myospores are produced by meiosis. They give rise to the gametophyte. We get our plus and minus gametes. And they unite in the process of syngamy. Isomorphic. So isomorphic refers to the comparison between the sporophyte and the gametophyte. So we'll just draw an arrow between them and write next to the arrow isomorphic. And if we wanted to, we could draw a little Clodophora down here. Now you see that I am not an artist. There's my Clodophora. And we can draw a Clodophora up here. And you see they look exactly alike. That was actually a joke about my drawing. Isomorphic. Parthenogenic. See if parthenogenic. Orange is okay. Yep. Doesn't look orange, but it's all right. And so we just draw an arrow from the gametes back to the gametophyte. And that's parthenogenesis. And we can write there next to one of those arrows parthenogenesis. The only thing we haven't got is the asexual reproduction. Let's try dark blue. And we would draw that here off of the sporophyte. An arrow coming out, arrow coming back in. And right, maybe zoospores there and draw some little zoospores out here. And we could even write a little note to ourselves, asexual reproduction. That's it. Pretty cool, eh? And that brings us to Olva. And we know it's a dibionic life cycle. So after we draw our horizontal line to divide the paper into the haploid portion above and the diploid portion below, we know that there's going to be something up here, a multicellular organism up here, a multicellular organism down there. And we know on the top it's going to be the gametophyte. And on the bottom, it's going to be the sporophyte. And we also know that the organism is heterothallic, which means that there's going to be two kinds of gametophytes up there. So we have to draw the we have to write the word gametophyte twice. And we can call one of those the minus and one of those the plus, the metophyte. Now, I violated my initial um, the way that I would really like to draw these life cycles every time, which is to write meiosis over on the left first, and syngamy over here, syngamy leading to the zygote. And I've done that because I wanted to emphasize the dibionic nature of the life cycle with the gametophyte generation on the top separate from the sporophyte generation on the bottom of these diagrams. But now we've returned to our main way of writing this with meiosis and syngamy written below and above the lines. 
syngamy leading to the zygote. The zygote now easily growing into the sporophyte. The sporophyte via the sporangium undergoing meiosis or having cells that undergo meiosis leading to the myospores. And now because there are two gametophytes, we can write the word myospores twice. One set of myospores growing into the minus gametophyte and one growing into the plus gametophyte. The gametophyte then, the two gametophytes produce the gametes, the minus gametophyte, the minus gamete, the plus gametophyte, the plus gamete, and those two fuse in the process of syngamy. So we've got our basic dibionic life cycle. We just now have to make it correct for ovo, which means we've got to show how it's isomorphic. We, in a way, have shown that it's heterophthalic, but we could make that even more explicit. We've got to show that it's anisogamous, which we haven't done, and we've, we've got to put parthenogenesis in there, and we've got to put asexual reproduction in there. So we've done this. we basically drawn the basic dibionic life cycle. Now, with showing that it's heterothallic. Let me grab another color, and we can write up here heterothallic so that we know that those two gametophytes refer to that tone. Hetero, different, phallic, young shoot, and in this case referring to this gametophytic generation. We also know that the organism is isomorphic, so that's a term that refers across the generations, across the diploid and the haploid generation. So we can draw a line down between those two generations and write isomorphic next to that line. And if we know what the organism looks like, we can even make a rough sketch and all that is a flat plate, so we can draw some gametophytes and sporophytes up here. Little hold fast at the bottom, trying to show that they're isomorphic. Now I've drawn them different sizes just because of the different amount of space that's available. Anisogamous, so we know that anisogamous means that the gametes are different sizes. So one of these gametes is larger than the other one. We'll just draw the minus gamete a little bit larger. It's mobile, and the plus gamete a little bit smaller. And then, since I've done it in another color, we can just write in that area in that same color, anisogamous. So the organism then has different size gametes. Parthenogenesis. Parthenogenesis is really kind of an asexual way, method of asexual reproduction, but we draw it in a special way. It's, again, from the Parthenon, from the gametes now not going through sex, but forming the gametophytes. So we draw a line from the gametes back to their gamete respective gametophytes, and we can write parthenogenesis along those purple lines. And I'll just do it twice here. parthenogenesis. And finally, asexual reproduction, by the way, of diploid zoospores. So that's got to be down in the diploid portion of the life cycle. So there's going to be some kind of zoospores being produced off of here, off of the sporophyte. And we draw a little cycle running out from the sporophyte then. And if we'd like, we could draw some zoospores in there. And then write asexual reproduction. Within that circle. And even we could put a little arrow here and write diploid zoospores. So 
So there it is, the life cycle of ulva, which is the same, exactly the same as the life cycle of Cladophora, the first organism we saw in this. Now, ulva and Cladophora morphologically are very different organisms, but their life cycles are very similar to each other, which is why they're put closely, close together like this. Just as before we go on and look at the morphology of ulva, just imagine what it, how much work it took to find out, to do the research that discovered this information about ulva. This is a person's lifetime, or at least one lifetime that we have diagrammed on the board here in less than a couple minutes, just a couple minutes. So a tremendous amount of work went into these things. And that's also why we don't do this class as a laboratory where you explore the life cycles and discover them on your own. As long as you didn't want to graduate in the next five years or so, we could do that. But incredible amount of work went into these organisms. So the myospores are given, so the question is, what's the difference between myospores and zoospores? Myospores and zoospores. So look where they occur in the life cycle. Myospores are up here in the haploid portion of the life cycle, and they are given rise to by meiosis. Zoospores are mobile spores, mobile cells, that function in reproduction in some way, but they don't arise from meiosis. Now, I have made that a lot clearer than most textbooks have made that. And if you read textbooks, you will find they sometimes say that meiosis gives rise to zoospores. And if you read another textbook, they'll use the term a different way. And I, you know, I wish I could fix that, but I can't. So instead of just saying, we're gonna use these terms, kind of however uh, anyone wants to think about using them, and your interpretation is as good as anyone else's interpretation, we have made a consistent way of working with the terms in this class. And the consistent way is to call myospores are the ones that come out of meiosis. They are usually mobile in the algae that are almost always mobile, not always, but almost always mobile. We'll see examples of that where they're not mobile in a minute. And the zoospores are produced by mitosis. And they function in asexual reproduction. So for this class, and I believe for all textbooks, but it's not the case in all textbooks, those are the definitions and the best definitions, the ones that we're going to use. Here's all of them. It's a flat sheet of cells, one to two cells thick. On the very edge of the organism, it's maybe one cell. So it's this very tiny part here, it might be one cell thick. And then in the main part of the organism, every place else, it is two cells thick. So a flat sheet. It grows as an epiphyte, often as an epiphyte, epi upon, phyte plant. So that's what it's doing here. This thing here, it, that's not ulva, that's a red algae. We'll do the red algae next. So ulva, this green flat sheet is growing anchored to that red alga. There are different forms of ulva. It can be like this here, a big, this is the one we'll see in lab, a big flat sheet of cells. They can be kind of this, it's not really filamentous. It's still a flat sheet. It's just that the flat sheet is extended in these cases. Still one to two cells thick. Here are the zoospores. Again, as in most zoospores, they have more flagella than we find in the gametes. The gametes typically have two flagella, and I'm not asking you to memorize those things. I'm just trying to distinguish these guys, the zoospores, which are produced by mitosis, and the gametes, and in fact, the anisogamous gametes, which are produced by meiosis. Well, in this case, mitosis, but they come out of the process of mitosis via the gametophyte. But the last thing that produced them, the last division that produced those gametes was a mitotic cell division. It's a really cool organism. We'll see it in lab this week. So I think you'll enjoy 
you enjoy looking at that. Here's some chloroplasts. There's nothing really that special about the chloroplasts of ulva. They have these kind of cup-shaped chloroplasts in all those cells. They're a little different from Clamidomonas and those others, but you still have the basic shape of that. They are light micrographs here, and you might see them a little bit like this in lab. It's like, like the light micrographs, although it's very difficult to see uh, that quality of a photograph in our laboratory. Certainly, you don't see these fluorescence photographs. But. So there's our chloroplasts of ulva. Yes, so question. Even though the one organism looked like you said it looked like it was filamentous, but it wasn't really. So they don't remember there's the fragmentation. No, these guys do not reproduce through fragmentation. They're not filaments. They're flat sheets of cells. Okay. Now, let, I, if I wanted to be really correct about that, I would let, we would say that it is not a major mechanism of reproduction. The algae are all somewhat more than land plants are able to do to grow through fragmentation, but this is not a major way of reproducing an ulva, and so we're okay with saying it's not, not a reproductive method for asexual reproduction. So you said it's more than two cells thick, but how many cells do It's a, so uh, many of these cases, you know, you can get a small sheet of cells in ulva, you can get a big sheet of cells, so it's an indefinite number, many cells, many cells. Some of these things, you just can't count the number of cells, and that's what we mean when we, in the labs when we say an indefinite number. Here's the characteristics, and again, just take a minute to appreciate the fact that even if you haven't got every part of these characteristics right, wow, did you, whoa, you know, like two weeks ago, you wouldn't have any idea about any of those things. So you're really starting to get a feeling for what these organisms are like and how they reproduce. And I think that's really great. They're exciting kinds of organisms, and they're kind of, some of these things you may see at the beach when you go. We'll talk about that uh, as we come to some more of them today. Another thing we want to do, besides being able to draw the life cycles, in fact, even more than being able to draw the life cycles, is we want to be able to interpret these diagrams of the life cycles that we see in textbooks. And sometimes to correct them. Look at this fertilization. Uh huh. How correct is that? There you go. Believe what your textbooks say, right? Syngamy. So that shouldn't be fertilization, that should be syngamy. So we want to be able to interpret these uh, textbooks and maybe even sometimes correct them. So let's look, work on interpreting this diagram. And the first thing we want to do is we want to look for syngamy and meiosis so we can draw our basic horizontal line here. Meiosis is going to go under the line, syngamy on top. So our line that divides the or this life cycle into a haploid stage, in this case it is above, and a diploid stage below, would run like that. The line runs like that. So we can then find, based on this, we can find the sporophyte and the gametophytes. And you notice there are two gametophytes here. And so there we have our two main parts of our dibionic life cycle. We can also look for the gametes. And we see that they're drawn here in several places. So these are all gametes, really all the way up through there. And if you look very closely, you can see that they are anisogamous, but they're not drawn very carefully here. So. anisogamous gametes. Our myospores, and they've just got them labeled spores here, but these are what we are calling, because they are, myospores. Let's just look at the same thing again, but this time we're going to add some of our other terms here. So now we see that there are <coughs> the gametes. <coughs> Excuse me. On the two sides of the two sides of our line, the not the gametes, but the organisms, the sporophyte and the gametophyte, look like each other, and so this is an isomorphic. 
life cycle. And the gametes, I keep saying gametes, got gametes on the mind this morning. The gametophytes also look like each other, and there are two of them, and so these, these are heterothallic gametophytes. We already said anisogamous gametes. The sporangia, well, the sporangia in all of them are not really well differentiated. That is, there are not, there are just regions of the flat plate that produce the gametes. And so really what's shown here then is this section of the flat plate of cells where the flat where the cells are going to go through meiosis. And so these are the sporangia, the cells in that area. And that then produces our myospores again up there. So the one thing we're missing then is, well, two things we're missing are the kinds of asexual reproduction, the two kinds of asexual reproduction. And so we can draw back from our gametes back to our gametophytes, our process of parthenogenesis. And then off of our gametophyte, off of our sporophyte, down here we don't really have room, but we can draw asexual reproduction And at least it's written in another color. So even though we don't have to, space to draw our zoospores, we'll know that that's asexual reproduction off of the sporophyte. So the ability to interpret these life cycles is also very important. Let's go on to some of our other organisms. We've got a number of other ones to learn today, and this is a really cool one. This is the one we talked about at the very first lecture in the class. This is the mermaid's wine cup. Acetabularia. So there is acetabularia in this person's hand, plucked out of the perhaps the intercoastal waterway in Florida, or goes along uh, um, these kind of shallow, not too not too rapidly moving intertidal areas, always submerged in there. So you can, if you have enough money and you own one of those beautiful houses down along the waterway, you can walk up into your dock and look down and I'll sometimes see acetabularia right there. So there it is. What's he holding now? What is this thing now? So this is a really unusual organism, our first really weird organism, really weird, beautiful, cool organism. This is a, a um, this thing that he's holding is called a siphon. Siphon means tube. And you know, if you were an idiot like I was as a kid, and when you used to be able to take your garden hose and stuff it down your tank of your gas tank and swoop up a little gas to put it in your lawnmower, that was a really stupid thing to do. Don't ever do that. But that was, a, we said it's siphoning out, right? So we took a tube and we put it down and we siphoned out some gas from the gas tank. You used to be able to do that because you didn't have protections in your gas tank that prevented you from doing stupid things. <clears throat> so the same thing, it's a tube. What's that mean, a tube? Well, that whole thing there, see how big it is? That's, well, I'd say it's a cell, because, but it's not really a cell because, but it is a cell because it doesn't have any cell walls. It's this huge bag, huge tubular, and then divided up into compartments at the top, bag of cytoplasm. Now, when I say bag of cytoplasm, mostly it's going to be a vacuole in the center of that, like all the cells we've seen. But it's something completely different, and that's why we give it this name of a siphon. It's also an organism that, at least for part of its life cycle, is cenocytic. Remember, that means that it's got multinucleates in one cell, if there were cells here, which there aren't. 
this organism is so strange that we really can't even draw its life cycle. Well, maybe we could, but it would be very difficult. We are not gonna try to draw a life cycle for this, and you'll see why in just a minute as we get into talking about how it reproduces and so on. Um, so not only does it have this strange structure of a siphon, so there's the siphons, and not only is it senacidic, but it's got a very unusual way of reproducing, which we'll come to. There are some cysts in this cap, so this cap forms at some part of its life cycle. And if we look inside that cap at the right stage, we see cysts. Those cysts, cyst means a bag or a bladder. It's often a resting cell, a cell that's undergoing a resting stage but we can just think of it as a little compartmentalized cell. So at a certain part of the life cycle, there are things that form inside this siphon. And it's those things, those cysts, where the gametes are gonna form. So let's look at that in more detail. So we're gonna kind of draw, but not really a life cycle with this diagram. We just mentioned the gametes, so let's start there. And so here's our gametes. And you know they're gonna produce the zygote. So in the process of syngamy, this is not a typical life cycle you can see already we produce this diploid organism, this initially diploid. But it's a diploid siphon, no cell walls. So there's a single nucleus, and that nucleus is usually down here in this hold fast. Now the organism itself doesn't develop any cell walls. There's no cell divisions. But the nucleus divides by meiosis. And we get four haploid nuclei. So now we have a siphon with four haploid nuclei in it. And so now we went from a uninucleate stage to a multinucleate stage. So this part of the organism, all over here, this is all multinucleate. Or, in other words, it's senocytic. A common bag. Senocytic and haploid. So there was this initial part of the thing where it was siphonous and maybe not senocytic because there's only one nucleus and diploid, but it quickly goes into this senocytic and haploid stage. And there's development then throughout this period of time. It starts to form these little weird projections on the top. Those projections of air eventually are shed and it forms a real cap. So what we're gonna look at is the cap. And inside the cap, there are cysts. These Black areas, these are the cysts. And those cysts then, here's one of them pulled out. And in that cyst, there are mitotic cell divisions. And these form the gametes. And there again are the gametes being released. So we're back around to the process of <clears throat> syngamy of the gametes. So what is this life cycle? Is this a monobionic haploid life cycle? Kind of, it's probably closest to that of anything, but it doesn't really fit <clears throat> really well into any of our 
into any of our terms. We don't exactly want to say it's monobionic haploid because look, it's not just the zygote here, it's this organism which has got a diploid nucleus in it, which is a siphon. So it's not just a resting zygote, so it doesn't fit. So we're not even going to try to characterize it in, the, in that, but we're just going to say, this is a really cool organism. And it doesn't fit our classifications very well. <clears throat> and I am not going to ask you to draw out or mem memorize all of these kinds of things. Regardless of what it might seem like, like now, I really am not interested in having you memorize lots of stuff. I want you to be able to understand the life cycle so well that you can picture a life cycle and you can interpret new life cycles that you haven't seen before. And we'll be doing that on the midterm and so on, having you look at life cycles that you haven't seen before and interpreting them based on what you've learned about these other life cycles. So you should know the basic structure and <clears throat> basic reproduction of, that, of acetabularia, but I don't expect you to be able to reproduce that kind of detail. Now, however, if you can reproduce that kind of detail, if you study at that level so that you can reproduce that, you got, you got these, the, the, you had to come into the quiz, on the quizzes and the exams and you're going to say, why didn't he ask us some hard questions on this? These are so easy. That's such a, that's such a great feeling. I kind of recommend you do that. Learn it at that level. Yes, question? So there's no uh, fragmentation either? No, it doesn't really fragment in this way, no. Okay. We're going to talk about siphonous organisms that do fragment. And here's one, bryopsis. We'll take a break right after bryopsis. Bryopsis is another organism we'll see today, and you should make sure you look at this one because you can see this one under your microscopes <clears throat> and you can find a cell, <clears throat> try to find a cell wall in there. This is another siphonous organism. And so another cenocytic organisms. So it's siphonous and cenocytic. <clears throat> so you can get that feeling here. I don't have a great picture of it, but you can see here that this is, these are all the siphons, or these siphons. It's all one, I don't want to say cell. It's not anything like a cell you've ever seen. It's this multinuclear tube. There are no cell walls in there. There's, there's no cell wall on these branches. There's completely continuity. Now, the center is full of a vacuole of all of those, but it's still cytoplasm on the outside. It's apical growth on all of these. And it does, this does go under, undergo fragmentation. So this one can break up and continue to grow. Pretty weird stuff when you think about it for an organism which is siphonous and cenocytic. You would think it would all just leak out. I said we would stop there, but we're going to do codium last. The last one of this group is codium. <clears throat> codium is a not the third one that is siphonous and cenocytic. And it <clears throat> has a, the structure where these siphons are all very tightly interwoven together to produce these rope-like structures, rope or cord-like. Um, let me call them branches. So those are not the siphons that we see here. This is not a siphon. This is a whole bunch of things woven together, all the siphons woven together. And I'll show you a picture of that in just a second. <clears throat> Codium is a organism that grows in intertidal zones. You can kind of see it hanging off the cliff here. It's often subject to lots of wave action, so it's really bashed around a lot. Um, in the northeastern United States, it grows along the coast, Maine coast, Massachusetts coast, um, very, very prevalently. It is not at all rare. Oh, here it is in North Carolina. This is out at, actually at, out at Topsail Beach. This is one of the ones you can see along the beach. You'll sometimes be walking along the beach in North Carolina, and you'll see this up on the thing. You might not know it. You pick it up, and it kind of hangs down. It's kind of like its common name. Its common name is Dead Man's Fingers. And so if you see an organism that looks a little like green Dead Man's Fingers, that's it. Here it is again, the beach of North, in the beach of North Carolina. So look for that next time you go down there. Here's a not really great picture. We have it, but you see what it's doing here. It's growing on a clam. 
or an oyster. It's growing so, they grow so abundantly on these clams or the oysters that they become a pest of oyster beds. They can actually smother them to the point where they can kill the oysters. Here are the siphons. This is a siphon. And so this whole thing then would be that branch that I talked about. So you can take one of these and we'll have it in lab and you can tease them apart. Teasing apart means you know breaking them apart a little bit under the microscope and then you'll be able to see the siphons. But what you're picking up then is not siphon. You also see how tough they are. So of course now here is an organism which by any logical mechanism should not be able to survive when you break because it's siphonous, the vacuole should pop open, all the cytoplasm should just spill out and lose the organism, and of course that doesn't happen at all. This is a major way of reproducing for this organism is fragmentation. And that's why it becomes such a pest of oyster beds because it can just be broken up and continue to grow, latch onto a new area on the bottom of the ocean or on a cliff and become a really pest. So it is actually a, almost a weedy organism out there. Not something you would expect from a siphonous organism. Are there like cell walls between the different siphons? There are no cell walls between the siphons. It's all one big tube. The whole organism, just imagine how that is. These things are huge, so there are hundreds of miles of siphon in there, all one. All one. What separates the siphons from each other? What makes it so it's not just one siphon? The, uh, it is just one siphon. They don't separate from each other. It's all, they're all connected. Yeah, I know. So is it Weird, eh? Sorry? It's a new term, siphonous. It's, it's a new kind of organism. It is neither unicellular nor multicellular, it is siphonous. It's a new thing, that's why plants are so cool. Whole new way of being. And if we're not done yet, wait till you get to the fungi. You think this is weird. Here's the chloroplast, nothing special about the chloroplast, but what we can see, this is the tip of one of those siphons, and you can kind of get a sense that that whole center of the siphon's vacuum. All the cytoplasm is out to the periphery of that siphon, and the center is the big vacuole in, in there. And that's it, that's where we're gonna break, that's the end of the oval